Uh, did, you, did you hear one about the farmer? Was it? The farmer wanted to be nominated for a Nobel Prize because he was outstanding in his field. Oh. He's outstanding in his own field. Yeah. And he's, yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. He's yeah. Absolutely belting. Yeah. Yeah. That was Hugh, he, he's one of the officials from ASAP, and he made that joke. We're in Bath now, and I think we're, we're a bit tired because the conference is over, and we're now heading out for the usual traditional pint and a pint and some food. Um, this is it's lovely to be back in Bath, if you remember my well, my report of the ARC convention about how much I like this place, how clean it is and how pretty and attractive. Yes. Um, There's not many homeless Scottish people on the streets here. That's like it, yeah. Uh, that's it. And um, it's clean and it's, it's got a lovely atmosphere. Um, the last speaker of the day was Mark Pilkington. And um, now I've heard, a lot, I've heard that guy mentioned a lot in not very, very favourable terms by various UFO researchers. Um, now, um, I listened to his speech, and I, can, I think I can understand why that is now. Um, the reason is, it's because basically he says that it, he talks about folklore. He said, talks about the same thing that David Clark did at the Weird Conference. Do you remember my report on the Weird Conference last year? And he said that um, UFOs are effectively um, Im imaginary myths, and they're encouraged, even created. He didn't actually say it was created, but he said that you know, the, most of it, if not all of it, is encouraged by the government in order to launder their own intelligence operations. So if they want to, for instance, you know, the classic one is Roswell. They were flying this Project Mogul balloon, uh, something that never even came out until about 1999. Um, and so they, when it crashed, they, made, they encouraged the myth of this Roswell UFO because they didn't want people knowing about Project Mogul, which is crazy because why wasn't Project Mogul declassified no, well, years yeah, late, you know. I mean, the, all the other things like the spy rings and the Polaris system and all that stuff, that was all declassified in the 60s. So why the hell wasn't Project Mogul? So on my view, own view is this kind of thing is a double bluff. It's, it's not that the, the government are inventing UFO stories to cover up their inter intelligence operation. It's the other way around. They're inventing intelligence operations to cover up UFOs. But Mark Pilkington has written a book called Mirage Men. Right. Um... <coughs> Now, he talks about things like Arthur Macken, the famous horror story writer, and the Angel of Mons. Um, I mean, David Clark talks about this, about the, the tracing how mythologies arise. And I suppose I'm interested in this to a certain extent. I mean, for instance, piranhas, right? We all know that piranhas, you, if you jump into a pool of piranhas, they'll eat you alive, and there'll be nothing left of you but bones. Right? But that's mythology. It's not true. It's not true because piranhas only take one bite and swim away. Yeah. Piranha, if you, if you did jump into a pool of piranha fish, you would, um, you'd probably get, they could give you a nasty bite actually, they can be quite fierce, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't attack you. Piranhas usually hunt in schools of about four or five, and they prefer carrion, you know. They're called the vultures of the, the vultures of the river, that's what the Amazonian Indians call them. They do attack live prey sometimes, but usually when it's a lot smaller than themselves. They don't usually go for anything, unless they're really hungry, they'll go for like a, a, a water rat or something. But they don't attack humans, and they, they don't do that much damage on humans. But the piranha story comes from various um, films, rather cheap B-movies and books that came out in the 50s, and it's become sort of like a myth that's taken hold. Now, the, the mistake people like David Clark and well, if it is a mistake and not deliberate yes. lies, <laughs> the mistake that these people make is they then say, well, this is what UFOs are. Anyone, anyone with it, who looks at it, the tiniest depth at the, uh, into the UFO phenomenon and other paranormal phenomena will see that this is nonsense. It doesn't even come close to explaining yeah, the entire phenomenon. Absolutely, and I mean, in, in the UFO community in general, people are very careful not to say, it's an extraterrestrial yeah. or anything like that. Everyone generally sits on the fence and they use terms like um, to quote Nick Pope, we can't rule it out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, the, the thing about it is we've got to realise is the, the so called most gullible members of society, as the skeptics like to call them, must call us in their patronising language, are much better witnesses and much more intelligent than these people give us credit. And a good example is the Avery Carlos. What happened was, these skeptics play the, the, the skeptics like to play these kind of tricks. Um, they got together a guy who built a model aircraft that looked exactly like a flying saucer. And they flew it over um, Avery during the summer solstice when lots of hippies and people like that were gathering. And they were waiting for all the stories to come through. They're hoping to generate a complete UFO myth. Well, it backfired because the people did report UFO, but they described the craft accurately. They basically describe what they saw. There's no embellishments about mind beams and, you know, angels flying out of it. It was they, they described it accurately. Accurately, this proves that these people are much better witnesses than I previously thought. Now, um, 
after Mark Pil Pilkington finished his little diatribe, um, the next uh, the next segment, it was the Q and A session, and me and Richard both asked questions. Richard asked his questions about the Knobs for Cox campaign. Yeah. You're going to set up a website, Knobs uh, for I, Cox. I don't think I'm going to set up a website because it's more for the paranormal community, but mm. I certainly plant the seed and sow it because why should Brian Cox demonise the paranormal researchers when he's researching something that's invisible and only hypothetical himself? Hypocrite. I think the Higgs boson, yes, yeah. Absolutely. That's it. And why is it why is it when people are very clever in one particular field, like Stephen Hawking's the same. I mean Stephen Hawking has made some incredibly ignorant comments about UFOs. Why is it when we when people exhibit enormous intelligence and knowledge in one field, we assume they're omniscient about every subject? They're not. Stephen Hawking knows fuck all about UFOs and he's proved it by his stupid remarks. And so does Brian Cheesy Grin Cox. So um, Anyway, I, I asked um, Dr. Paul Rogers a question. Um, so several people were sort of like putting their hands up and saying, talking about the various coincidences of that happened to them, the dreams they had and things like this. And he was rebutting them with um, stories about, um, well, you know, how many, how many misses did you have? Did you remember all the dreams you had? How many dreams did you have? And how many events sooner or later is bound to happen? He's things like this. talking about extremely large number theories. Yeah, he was talking about, and he was using it as a get out of jail free card. Yeah. Because he can't be proved wrong, like you yeah. were saying. He can't be proved wrong. I asked him a question. I said, I'm going to think we've got a bit of a dilemma here, mate, you know. Because, um, you know, about Carl Jung, Carl Jung's work on synchronicity. I'm saying, now, is, is, it, is anything so unlikely that so infinitesimally unlikely by chance that it can never happen because if the answer is no you have effectively a, a, um, an unfalsifiable rebuttal to anyone who says anything like that and if the answer is yes then you've got to ask yourself okay if there is if some things are so unlikely they can never happen in any physical process where's the cutoff point then when does coincidence become synchronicity in your view and he couldn't answer me he, he, he evaded the question I'll give you an example, right? Supposing somebody has a dream where they predict all the lottery numbers accurately in properly controlled laboratory conditions for six months, every single week for six months. That person will obviously be very rich, but apart from that, every single sensible person, right, will say that there's something in it. This person's saying is coincidence. It's not coincidence. This person, every single sensible person will say that, right? And, and this is the irony, you know, people, people, he basically says that synchronicity is real. They'd have to admit that synchronicity is real. But the, the idiocy, of, the idiocy of, of Paul Rogers' position and people like him is that they can still say, well, it's just a coincidence and they could be right. Mm. Do you see what I mean? There's, if there's no cutoff point, then nothing is too unlikely to be true. And he, he, he gave me a lot of flannel about, well, come to the laboratory, do laboratory tests. And I said, look, but the point is, though, that it doesn't matter if you do laboratory tests, does it? It doesn't matter. If you do laboratory tests, you can still say it's a coincidence. So, uh, anyway, I'm we're a bit tired now, so later on I'm going to do a little experiment in the hotel room. I'm going to try out this mirror staring trick. But I'll join you later for that. See you in a bit. Thanks, mate. There you go. Yeah.